So just a few remarks for the final. If uh, on the final a problem looks like you can solve it by greedy method, well, unless I really made a, a bad mistake, um, you are wrong, right? So don't try to solve uh, uh, problems using greedy. I chose them so that I test your understanding of dynamic programming. But if I did make a mistake and you can solve it with greedy, and you provide a proof that your solution is correct, of course you get full credit and it's my fault. But uh, I tried to find problems that uh, genuinely need uh, dynamic programming. Uh, and of course, uh, don't try to solve it by no technique whatsoever, just to kind of hack it because, again, unless I was completely out of my mind when I, suggest, when I chose the problems that definitely will not work and will not get you any partial credit if you try to brute force uh, uh, something. So when you practice dynamic programming problems, okay, try to, okay, the problem is that students Try to use dynamic programming, but also hack it uh, the, at the same time, sort of. Uh, they try to come up with some uh, uh, kind of mixed solution that, uh, so try to think in a dynamic programming way. What is the whole point of dynamic programming is uh, you want to find sub problems to make the recursion as simple as possible, right? So let me give you um, an example of uh, um, I guess we can do, even though the deadline was changed, uh, we can do one of your homework problems. So you have two sequences, right? Um, this is sequence B, and you have a longer sequence A, right? And uh, you want to count the number of ways B can be embedded into A, right? Um, so, So you see, one might be tempted to try to solve this problem by um, looking, say, looking at the first symbol here, say it's a B, and then looking at all possible appearances of B, and then trying to map uh, B either here or here or here and so forth, right? While in principle it's possible to do it that way, uh, ex except that then sub-problems would be suffixes uh, of the strings, uh, not the prefixes of the string, right? Because after you map, say, this B into that B, you are left out with uh, uh, a shorter substring, but from the right. So this would be the very beginning, or, or actually the very end of B, and you would look then how many ways you can embed this into that, right? But the whole point uh, of dynamic programming is that you want to keep the recursion as simple as possible. And in this case, it just happens that uh, dealing with prefixes uh, is actually uh, much simpler. And you should resort to kind of case analysis. Uh, what if I do this or if I do that? Uh, only if it doesn't work otherwise. You should try to keep the recursion as simple as possible. 
So let's try to do it with uh, prefixes. Uh, so this would be uh, b from 1 up to i. And here you would have a from 1 up to j. Right, so we, uh, we look at all possible truncations uh, of uh, A and all possible truncations of B, and we want to investigate, uh, uh, to, find, to compute the number of ways B can be embedded into A, right? And now notice there are, uh, there is uh, just two cases to consider. Uh, first case is uh, uh, if uh, bi is not equal to a j, right? Uh, in this case, uh, let's call the number of ways uh, n of i j is the number of ways uh, a from, uh, sorry, b from 1 to i uh, can be embedded in uh, a 1 to j, right? So we are looking, uh, say, if total, if uh, A is of length, uh, uh, say, if, uh, if uh, length of A is equal to N and uh, length of B is equal to M, what we are really interested in is N of uh, uh, M n, right? But to find that, um, we will compute all possible n ij's uh, for all i and j. So what would the recursion look like if uh, the n point here is not equal to n point here? The only way how you can embed this sequence into that sequence is embedding it in the sequence when you drop the very last one because you cannot map this to that, right? So uh, n of i j will be equal to n of i j minus 1 if uh, uh, b i is not equal uh, to a uh, j, right? Now, if, uh, in fact, uh, so if b, uh, if uh, let's see what we get if uh, bi is equal to aj, well, then you can do two things. One thing is you can embed uh, bi, you can map it into aj, and then count how many ways you can extend uh, that embedding, right? Uh, because for the very last one, you know what uh, unique way how you can extend, right? So this will be uh, n of uh, i minus 1 into j minus 1, right? Because that will be number of ways to embed everything but the last here into everything but the last here. But that's not your only option. Even though the endpoints match, you don't have to embed this here. You can also embed it strictly inside, right? And get a correct embedding. So to this, 
you have to add n of the whole sequence bi being embedded in uh, uh, the sequence j minus 1. Right, so if they are different, you don't have a choice. You have to embed everything uh, into the truncated sequence uh, uh, a up to j minus 1. But uh, if they are equal, then if you do map this into the endpoint here, you can extend it to in uh, n i minus 1, j minus 1 ways, right? Because that's the number of ways the leftover can be mapped inside uh, the leftover here. Plus, you don't have to use the last element. You can also embed this inside. And so you have to add this. How do you, in what order do you fill the table of uh, nij? Well, you fill the table according to the sum of i plus j because in both cases, sum of their sum drops for at least one. Here it drops for two. Here it drops for one. So the table will be filled according to the sum of uh, uh, i and j. So essentially, it is uh, uh, one dimensional. You, you can still put things in two dimensional table because it's easier to write, write it down. But the ordering is according to the sum i plus j. And notice how simple it is. There is no thinking, OK, how many ways uh, I can go with this here. And then, so uh, you see, the, the, to really make it, uh, after all, what are these problems? These problems are silly little problems for practice. Do we really care that much about uh, how many ways you, you can embed one sequence in the other? I don't know. Maybe, maybe in some kind of protein study or some geno genetic, maybe. But it's essentially just a good example, right? You part of the, it's not, the goal is not just to solve the problem. Even if your solution is, um, correct by, but unnecessarily complicated. You want to learn to think in a dynamic programming way because this will allow you to solve much harder problems uh, that uh, you cannot handle with uh, just uh, uh, some kind of clever tricks. OK, so let us look now at uh, I hope you had a look at these problems at home. Um, but, um, okay, so uh, let us do the following problem which is also kind of confusing to uh, students. Uh, so assume that you have uh, um, n1 many objects of size S1. Uh, or, or say n many objects of size S1, m many objects of size S2, and k many objects of size S3. Uh, and you have boxes of capacity C, okay? You have to pack these objects into as few boxes as possible. Now, this is yet another example that students kind of try to 
cleverly hack, but uh, unfortunately, uh, one really needs dynamic programming uh, to handle this one. How would you solve this problem? Any ideas? Uh, which question? Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, very good. In fact, uh, um, this is another example of a problem that solution looks as if it's brute force, but it is not. First of all, um, you see, what's the problem? Uh, how about, say, stuffing first uh, as many objects of s of type of size s1 and then uh, uh, when you if there is any leftover space you try to add uh, maybe smaller size objects unfortunately this does not work what you solve are the following uh, problems opt i j uh, what shall we use i j uh, uh, P for all I less than or equal between zero and less than or equal to N, um, all uh, J between zero and less than or equal to M, and all K between zero and less than or equal to uh, sorry, P less than or equal to K. So the table will be three-dimensional, right? Of course, it's uh, hard to draw it uh, by hand, but uh, three-dimensional arrays for a computer are about as uh, simple as two-dimensional arrays to store, right? So how would you find, so what is opt? Opt I J uh, I, J, uh, P is uh, smallest number of boxes needed uh, to pack Uh, I many objects uh, of uh, size uh, S1, uh, J many objects of size S2, and uh, K many ob and P many objects uh, of size S3. What does the recursion do? How would you solve this problem? How would you find the minimal number of objects, so sorry, boxes to store this many objects of each kind? How would you do it? Uh, really, if you were uh, stuck with that problem, how would you how would you solve it? Mm-hmm. So, as I mentioned, uh, this problem is an example of something that looks like uh, brute force, but it is not. So, what would you do? Assume, again, you will order the sub-problems by size uh, i plus j plus p. So, instances will be solved in the order of the value of i plus j plus p, with events broken in any order you want. So assume that, uh, say, for a certain number you solved uh, for all i, uh, j, and p such that uh, i plus j plus p is smaller than uh, K, 
or say, yeah, how would you solve it? How would you solve an instance uh, when i plus j plus p is equal to k? Yeah? If you have already solved all instances when the sum is smaller than k. So, and you store the results in a table. What would you really do? What's the logical thing to do? You just try all possibilities, right? So you would take a box, right? Uh, so here is one box of capacity C and fill it with uh, objects of uh, size S1 only. Okay, and you see how many objects you can put, um, how many objects of size S1 you can put here. This will be what? It will be C divided by uh, S1 and then floor of that, right? This is how many objects of just first type you can put in, okay? Then uh, you put one object of the second type and fill with all, uh, with uh, the rest with objects of size S1, right? Then you would put two objects of the second type fill with objects of S1. This will all be filling one box, but the number of objects will strictly drop. So if I say put this many objects of one of type one, then all I have to do is look at opt of uh, I minus uh, C over S1 floor and add one to it, uh, which is just this box, uh, right? Then you put one object. So essentially you try all possible combinations of the objects uh, of uh, uh, type one, two, and three as you can. You look how many, if you say, uh, say if you can uh, fit uh, uh, K if you can fit, uh, fit, say, alpha many objects uh, of size C1, beta many objects of size uh, C2, and gamma many objects uh, of size C3, then you would have to look at opt I minus alpha, uh, J minus uh, uh, beta, and uh, P minus gamma, and uh, so you will take min of this when alpha, beta, and gamma are such that uh, uh, alpha times uh, uh, C1 plus beta times uh, C2 plus gamma times C3 is smaller or equal than C and you take mean of all of these and you add one to that and that's your result for i, j, and p. So the recursion step is exhaustive search, right? But uh, uh, the whole con uh, algorithm is not uh, an exhaustive search because all the sub-problems are solved only once and the solutions are stored in a table. Yes? Sorry? That's how many, so you will range through all possible integers alpha, beta, and gamma so that uh, this combination of objects fit in C, in a single box, right? For example, let, let's, uh, let's give an example.
say uh, C1 is equal to 1, uh, or say C1, let's say it's equal to 2, C2 is equal to 3, and C3 is equal to 5. Uh, and uh, your box is of capacity C is equal to 10, uh, right? And uh, say you have uh, uh, 1,000 objects of type, uh, uh, this is not C, this should be S, right? So I, 1,000 objects of size S1, 500 objects of size S2, and uh, how many, whatever, 100 objects uh, of type S3, right? So what would the recursion look like? Uh, so what it, it would be opt of uh, uh, I, J, uh, P is equal mean, of the following. So what did we say? First we try to fill the, uh, the box entirely with objects S1. So this will be how many you can put five of them, right? So this will be then opt of I minus five uh, J uh, J, K, so uh, beta and gamma are zero here, right? So uh, then, what did we say? Rather than filling everything with S2, we now put one of size three and then try to fill. So this will be uh, opt, uh, and so J, will go down for one, right? Uh, how many uh, can we put? So uh, we have three, so seven is left, so we can put three of these. Uh, so it will be I minus three, and K is unchanged, right? Then uh, um, uh, you will have opt if you put two of these, uh, right? So this will be six and four is left. So you can put two of these. So it's uh, I minus two, J minus two, and K, right? Notice all of these is already in the table because some of uh, the three coordinates, uh, uh, actually it's not K, we call it P, right? And now you, com you simply try all uh, the remaining possibilities. So if you take three of these, uh, then you cannot put anything else. So the next one to try will be opt i j minus three p. And now we have to start adding. Uh, um, so then all, uh, so, um, then we start adding five, right? So then you will have opt. Okay, if I have, I'll have P minus one, so the leftover capacity is uh, uh, five. I can put two of these, uh, right? So it will be uh, J minus two I, uh, or is it I minus two J P minus one, then I'll have opt of uh, what will it be? Uh, so I can put uh, one of these and then put uh, uh, only one of these and uh, one of these, this would be five and five, so it's 10. So it's I minus one, J minus one, and P minus one. And finally, the very last one will be opt i, j, and then p minus 2 plus 1 because we are filling one of the boxes. So these guys all sit in the table 
you already have computed these. Uh, and so you just take mean of these, add one, and that's uh, your value for IJP. So you exhaustively, the recursion step is simple brute force search, right? Exhaustive search. But um, the whole procedure is, of course, not because the number of ways how you can take different objects, uh, how many ways can we, uh, can we you know, it's, it, it's exponential, right? If you uh, try to go through all possible cases with all possible boxes. So here the recursion is the only brute force is this, but this is, so to speak, a short search, right? And uh, uh, once you compute uh, for the smaller values of i, j, and p, you can compute for i, j, and p using uh, a recursion like this. Sorry. Yes? So you only need to, like, I mean, even though it's a brute force, you only, brute force, you only have to do the brute force part once, right? Because the set of, like, the solution Yes, is, yes, right? exactly. Exactly. So this will be, uh, this, uh, you know, nothing changes because it's the same boxes. All boxes are equal. So the recurrence you build up only once, uh, and then it's a piece of cake to just look at a few places in the table, pick the minimum, and add one. Uh, yeah. So the recurrence doesn't change. You do it once, uh, you establish once, what the formula looks like, and then it's the matter of just uh, look up in the table, right? The recursion simply tells you at what cells in the table to look, to take min and add one. So it's actually extremely fast. No uh, computation involved. Okay. Um, So here is another a little bit more interesting. Uh, you have to find the total number of partitions of an integer. Any questions so far? Please stop me anytime. So as I say, uh, uh, please, when you are studying, uh, make sure that you think in a di dynamic programming way. Don't try to kind of uh, preempt dynamic programming. Just try to think, how can I make the recursion as small as possible? Sometimes it's really not to, it's not easy to see how to recurse. Uh, it requires a little bit of uh, maybe some kind of trick that you already seen. So uh, let's, let's try to solve the following problem. The idea is kind of really important and is used in many examples. And you have seen it uh, when we did the shortest paths. And uh, technique is called relaxation. You just have to kind of make a clean and simple recursion. This is how you generalize the problem. So here is the problem. Um, you have to find a number. So find a, a number. of uh, ways, uh, or uh, say sets, number of sets, um, uh, whose um, elements sum up to uh, n. 
right? So essentially what you want to do is uh, you want to find the number of uh, sets that uh, uh, that um, say P1 up to PK, right? So that, so actually I should call it uh, multi sets, right? Because some of these can be equal. So, uh, so that P1 plus P2 plus PK is equal to N. So in how many ways can you split N into chunks that some that total uh, into n, right? It's a pretty tricky one how to count them. But the idea is uh, to use relaxation and dynamic programming. So uh, we will find uh, um, n of i j such that uh, uh, p1 up to uh, some whatever pm sum ups, uh, sums up to, uh, to say uh, j and uh, all p1 up to pm are smaller or equal to i. So we want to so we solve it by, by dynamic programming by solving all the problems for all possible j's that go up to n. So maybe you are interested only in uh, how many ways, yes. No, no. So I give you just a single number, say a thousand. So let's do an example. Uh, it's a little bit trickier. It is in a sense, uh, uh, coin change, you want to find minimum, minimal number of these guys. Here you want to find total number, right, when you but it, it obviously has similarity. In a sense, these P's are like coins. That's actually excellent uh, analogy. So let's formulate it. Uh, um, yes. Yeah, it will be a large number. It will be a quite a large number. So, for example, um, say uh, if the number is, uh, uh, how can we uh, formulate this? Uh, you are given coins uh, of value between one and a thousand. And the question is, uh, how many ways uh, can you give the value of a thousand using your coins, uh, right? Not minimal number of coins, but just in how many different ways uh, can you give the value of a thousand using coins uh, that are in value of one to one thousand. So, uh, so the dynamic programming says, Instead of doing it just for the value of a thousand, I'm going to do it for all possible values between one and a thousand. But even that is not enough to make a, a recursion. So this is where relaxation comes into play. So we will solve uh, for all j's that go between one and uh, w our number n, say a thousand, but with additional constraint uh, that the largest coin that we can use is equal to i, right? So for example, is i is equal to n, uh, to one, uh, how many ways can you give uh, uh, the value of 
So what is n of uh, 1 and 1,000? Hmm? So all the coins have to be smaller or equal to 1. This is the limit, uh, how large the coins can be. This is the total amount. So if I'm limiting that uh, uh, you can use only one uh, dollar coin, uh, how many ways to give a thousand? Uh, only one, that's right. Now, how many ways uh, to do it? Uh, what is n two and a thousand? Uh, a lot. <laughs> Because you can have, you can now try all possible cases with two and fill with one, but you can see that this quickly becomes very complex, right? If say n is a hundred, how many fifty coins? How many forty coins? It's really the analyzing the cases becomes overwhelming. So this is where the relaxation comes into the play because the recursion is almost trivial uh, if you do the, the constraint, the relaxation of the constraint. So let's see how to do it. So what is n of i j? How many ways? Can I give amount of j using coins that are at most i? Well, there are only two cases to consider. What do you think? Which will be the cases? Here, the limit is critical, right? So it will be equal to the number of ways in which I use at least one coin of size i plus the number of ways to do it if I don't use any coin of size i. So this will be simply n. If I do use a coin of size i, right, how many ways can I extend it to get uh, uh, j uh, total sum? I'm not saying you can use only one. So what will be the bound? Remains i, right? But what is the, the total amount? J minus i, very good. Right? Plus number of ways in which I do not use any coins of size i. So what is then the bound here? i minus 1, and what is the bound here? j, exactly. Now notice, right, um, these will be the cases that you have already computed, right? And uh, so this limit, what's the purpose of the limit? The purpose of the limit is just to allow you simple recursion because if you limit the upper limit, and of course eventually we will relax, i will become also n, right? But if you impose an extra limit, uh, then the recursion becomes extremely, uh, extremely simple. Okay. Um, so what are we going to, so th this is, so you see the, the whole philosophy of dynamic programming is uh, choose sub problems so that recursion becomes, if not simple, then at least manageable, right? So um, let's see. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Okay, so um, how about this? You are given a s string of truth values, truth, falsity, truth, 
truth, uh, falsity, 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 truth. And then you are given a bunch of operations uh, in between, O1, uh, O2, O3, O4, O5, O6, and can say here it will be O7 in this particular case. And each OI is either XOR, right? How do you, there are several ways to denote XOR. I guess engineers usually denote it like this, or and and or. And you want to find how many ways Uh, you can place parentheses uh, to get a uh, value uh, equals to tr true. How do we solve this problem? What is this problem kind of reminds you of? Uh, matrix multiplication, very good. Okay, on the final, you will have problems that all are solvable by the methods of these, these problems, right? Just some slight modification maybe, but uh, so make sure that you really understand how the DP works. So um, so let's see, how would you uh, solve this problem? If it's to be done like matrix multiplication, so say, uh, we, what did we do in matrix multiplication? We looked at all possible ways uh, uh, to place uh, brackets uh, between J and K, right? So if this is uh, uh, value V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, V7, V8, we will, for all substrings of the form VI, VI plus 1, up to VJ, yeah? right? Uh, we want to find, is it enough to look only at the number of ways to make the expression between I and J equal to true? Right, if I say take value V1, uh, sorry, value VI, this will be all I minus, no, I, all I, then VI plus one, all I plus one, and then here somewhere is uh, uh, all K, and here is VK plus one. I want to see I mean, at the end, I'm only interested in how many ways I can place the brackets so that this evaluates to true. But is it enough to look only for, say, let's call it uh, capital uh, T of IJ, which would be uh, equals to the number of ways to um, uh, to place brackets uh, to get um, let's call this string s i j yeah? to get s i j the value of s i 
a equal to true. Will this be enough? Huh? Look what operations we have. We have exclusive for and and uh, uh, and uh, or. How would you do? Um, how would you compute this? What do you have to look at? Huh? Hmm? Exactly. But in order, say I break this like this. Uh, so uh, say I look at V1, sorry, V i, operation i, V i plus 1, operation, and so forth, up to uh, say P, and then V P, and I take it to be up to here. And then operation p plus 1, and then here a value v plus, vp plus 1, and so forth up to vj. If I know how many ways I can make this true and how many ways I can make this true, is this enough to um, compute uh, in how many ways this is then true. What is the operation here that uh, causes trouble? XOR, because this can be true and this can be false, right? And uh, XOR will be, so we need to keep track of uh, um, both T, I, J, and uh, F, ij, uh, right? What will be the recurrence then? Okay, so this is what's, uh, you know, the dynamic programming problems that we do in class in this course. Uh, they all sound like silly stories. Who is, who would be interested in finding number of ways to place brackets to get uh, the expression equal to true? Do you think that you will ever encounter something like that in practice? You see, the thing is, uh, there are very serious problems uh, that are solved by dynamic programming that are bread and butter today, for example, something called Viterbi decoder that uh, is used in speech recognition and uh, uh, in, uh, uh, then a, a hidden Markov models and uh, just name it uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, bioinformatics, uh, uh, the counting uh, the uh, alignments of a particular gene within a genome and so forth. But the problem is that when you do a real life problem, there are always gazillions of small complications that kind of tend to obscure the essence of the dynamic programming. So we choose to practice on problems even though they might sound useless and silly, but they are good to practice your dynamic programming uh, uh, technique, right? So that you can uh, you can do then uh, um, so that you can apply it to people that do uh, finance. Uh, uh, there are whole books uh, that are written about dynamic programming uh, there and uh, also for bioinformatics. So it's dynamic programming is really not just for, for building towers of turtles, right? They are uh, for serious problems, but we just want to avoid talking about uh, specifics of, of the field, and we practice the problem-solving skills uh, 
um, in uh, on relatively silly problems like this. Okay, tell me the true of i j. Uh, how many ways I can place the brackets um, in this substring to get it to evaluate on true? It will be, let me help you, it will be a sum. So what is uh, the sum of what factors? Uh, The, of course, we will have to, and you are discussing what is the, which operation? The principal operation, right? But before we even know, uh, can discuss what's the principal operation, we have to know where we break it. And that's precisely where the sum comes in, because now um, k will go uh, between uh, uh, one, so how can I break this? I can take just vi and then the whole uh, rest, right? So, uh, and uh, the other extreme is vi all the way and then just vj at the end. So principal operation can be between uh, I and this one here is J minus 1, right? So K is, uh, uh, let's then just write it uh, um, between, um, okay, I guess we can do uh, between I to J minus 1. So now this will sum up all different possibilities where the principal operation is. But what do we sum? Now you're, exactly, you will have something like this here. Um, you will have, um, let me move this. Uh, if um, k, if operation k, okay, is equal to x or, how many ways can you make this true with uh, if the operation is? Uh, um, is uh, XOR. Exactly. So this is the Kate operation. Either this is true and this is false, or this is uh, false and this is true. So it will be T of uh, um, from I to Okay, uh, now, what do I have to do if I know how many ways this can be true and how many ways this can be false? What do I have to do with the values to get the total number of ways uh, for this to be true with the, under this assumption? Multiply it, very good, because you can independently make this true from in totally independently make this false. So you have to multiply it with uh, false uh, k plus 1 uh, j plus, uh, you will have plus false i k times true uh, k plus 1 j. What if this is a conjunction? When does this happen? When will it be true? If both are true, so it will be time, uh, the ways to make this true times the ways uh, uh, to make this uh, 
if uh, operation k is a conjunction, what happens with if the operation is disjunction? When will this be true? So this is true, and then whatever we choose here, right? So this will be t. Now, 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 now we have to be careful. So when this is true, and anyway, we, um, okay, so this will be true of i k times how how many ways for uh, this to be any either true or false? Uh, well, that's a, a Catalan number. It's number of ways to distribute brackets, right? But we have we know e very easily how to. What is the number of ways that this be either true or false? Uh, together. So it's uh, t of k plus 1 uh, j plus falsity of k plus 1 j. Uh, now, we have to be bloody, bloody careful here because we don't want to double count. We don't want to double count, right? And it's very easy to double count if you do it this way because if this can be arbitrary, and now I want to say, and now I count the number of ways to make this true. But this might be already counted here. So this is not a good idea. So we will do it case by case basis. So it will be true here and times falsity here. False of k plus 1 to j. Now these are two completely independent, plus uh, true of i k and true of uh, k plus one j, right? So true, true, and finally plus false of i k times true of k plus one. J. And now these are disjoint. There is no double counting involved at all. So what is a, short, sh a simpler way to, uh, what can I replace this uh, complicated three, three guys with uh, just uh, something much simpler? It is simply the total number of ways uh, yeah, that's not very, uh, it's good as it is. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to make a mistake and either double count something or, but you get the gist of it, right? It's again exhaustive search except that we notice it's not enough to look just when things can be made true. We also have to either keep track also when they can be make, uh, made false or uh, um, uh, just total number of placement of brackets. Uh, okay, let us see, is there something that... Uh, okay, here is a very nice one. You are given um, a long string of characters. You are given a long string of characters. Your task is to delete as few characters as possible without changing the ordering of what's left to obtain a palindrome. Right? So you have uh, something like A, B, C, A, B, C, C, A, and so forth. You want to delete um, 
you want to delete as many of the, I mean, as few of them as possible to get a uh, palindrome. There are two ways to solve this. One is by doing DP from scratch, but there is a very neat way to reduce this immediately into a problem that we have already solved. Uh, any ideas how you would do it? Huh? Yes. Uh, cut it in half, but you don't know where to cut in half. But the second part is actually the trick, what you said. Do longest common subsequence, but with what? Mm. Reverse, brilliant. So you simply take the sequence A, say this is A. You compute A reverse, let's denote it like this. And you find the longest common subsequence, uh, right? This gives you the longest palindrome uh, piece of cake. Very good. How would you do it if you didn't see that? Uh, um, how would you do it from scratch using DP? What would this remind you of? You want to find the longest common, I mean, sorry, the, the longest palindrome. And um, how would you do it by using more or less the trick of, uh, of uh, longest common subsequence kind of combination of this and maybe matrix multiplication? If I gave you a substring that goes from AI to AJ. How can you find the longest palindrome contained here if you solved already for smaller values of J minus I for shorter substrings? Yes. Okay, you compare the first, very good, first and last. What are the two cases? Oh, if, they're the same, if, they're the same. if they're the same, then how long is the longest common subsequence? So then opt, so opt ij is equal. If ai is equal to aj, then it's uh, opt uh, i plus 1, j minus 1. So notice this is now shorter, right, the, the distance, uh, plus 2, right, because we peeled off the, right, so because whatever is the longest palindrome that lives here, you just add these two and you are done, right? What will be if uh, AI is not equal to AJ? How do you find the longest palindrome that lives here? But by the simplest possible recursion. Yes? Uh, max of I, J minus one. Exactly. So this will be max opt i plus uh, uh, 1 j and uh, opt i j minus 1. Uh, i plus 1, right? i plus 1 all the way to here or here up to, uh, no, no, but here up to this. So you simply just build. You don't have to, you know, I used to give this one for homeworks and, you know, people will start looking, okay, let me see where I can find match inside. And in principle, you can do it, but that's, it defeats the technique, right? You want to train yourself to think uh, uh, in terms of dynamic programming, always looking for the, uh, 
short, uh, sorry, for the cleanest and simplest uh, uh, solution. Okay, let's make a short break and then we will do some more practice. No content about hash. And no, hash. no. God. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I mean.
So in case I didn't make it uh, clear, on the final, both for extended class and for this class, there will be only max flow and DP. Now, uh, because these are really the two uh, most important techniques in the second part, and I, have, I prefer that people master these two things really well than to do more stuff. Later, if you take programming challenges, uh, uh, you will do more on the string matching and uh, a host of other things. So I would really, if you are uh, serious about computer science, you should take programming challenges 4128. Uh, it is always delivered by one of these guys that were uh, winners on the programming competitions, right, who really um, are both good hackers and uh, good problem solvers. Uh, that's one thing. So concentrate just on these two techniques. Uh, uh, this does not mean for what I did during for the extended class, the hashing business. It's uh, it's really important, but it's kind of hard to examine people on that. So I kind of uh, tried one year and it didn't go very well. And uh, uh, so anyhow, the second thing is. Uh, Dynamic programming can be done in two ways, yes. Okay, so this is what we are going, there is definitely something on Friday uh, and it will be in the other classroom when we usually meet, right? And uh, I might prepare some more problems, but that will not be the point. The point for the next, for Friday class is to debug your understanding of stuff. So what I expect you to do is, uh, I hope you are starting to prepare for the final, uh, bring questions, right? And don't be shy to ask. And on Friday, if necessary, we stay till midnight, but uh, uh, I want you to, I want you to, um, uh, to really, I mean, this is hard stuff. DP is really challenging. Everyone finds it challenging, right? It's a tricky technique, uh, and it takes uh, lots of practice to master it. Um, so, um, but it's really crucial, important. So please don't be shy. So you bring your questions, uh, like what's the meaning of life? Or why am I here? And uh, <laughs> How come the aliens didn't get in touch with us already? Uh, and uh, we will discuss everything that you wanted to ask about algorithms, but were aware, but were afraid to ask. So there will be something on Friday, uh, but uh, format might be more fluid than this. Uh, so what did I want? Okay, so there are two ways to do DP. One is called uh, memoization, and the other one is what we have been doing, and I can, my, okay, I, you should make your own decision what is, uh, uh, which one is better. With present day hardware, in my experience, uh, doing it bottom up beats always the genuine recursion. Why? Because uh, recursion is hard for computers to do, and uh, uh, iteration is just piece of cake, especially with pipeline processors that, uh, uh, that can do iterations extremely quickly. Uh, what is the difference between recursion and iteration? How would you compute n factorial using recursion, and how would you compute it using iteration? Okay, so here, how, how would I write uh, in a kind of uh, 
with proper placement of brackets uh, recursion and how would I do it uh, by iteration? Yes, so so this can be written as uh, uh, this is uh, n times n minus 1 factorial, right? But it n factorial can be also written as uh, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 and so forth. What's the difference uh, in executing this versus executing that? How would computers treat uh, this recursion? Well, modern compilers actually, you, you, they don't let you fool it. They can recognize when it's uh, and switch it around to, to iteration. Uh, but in principle, how would you, how would computers solve something like that? Uh, it would say, okay, I have to multiply n with, oops, I don't have this. So it pushes everything on the stack and says, I have to now to compute n minus 1. Well, this is n minus 1 times uh, n minus 2 factorial. Oops, abort again the execution of this. I have to first compute that. And each step, it has to take the snapshot of the registers and shuffle them on the stack to uh, be able to get out of the uh, subroutines, right? To, to so all this multiplication would have to be aborted until you hit 1 times 2. And then it would go, it would backtrack until it gets to n. Here, there is nothing stored except the intermediate result. So simply this is do, uh, uh, do uh, factorial uh, is equal to uh, k times uh, factorial and then k plus plus uh, f for uh, uh, until you reach n, right? So you only store intermediate result you increment k and multiply, store that, res replace the old result with that one, multiply by k plus 1, and so there is no traffic to the stack at all, right? So that's the difference between iteration and genuine recursion, right? Now, it is true that in principle, when we w remember when we said, okay, for example, the, for the longest common subsequence, right, uh, we do for all uh, i and j less than m here and n here, and we are interested only in what it sits here, right? But we do, uh, we feel complete table, right? In many problems, to find what sits here, you don't have to know the entire table. So if you do it uh, by recursion, which is called memoization, you will not do anything that you don't necessarily need, right? So you will do fewer number of operations because in order to compute this, maybe you need only a subset of values that is not, uh, that doesn't include the whole table, right? But the the fact that you are doing fewer number of computation is usually uh, grossly uh, paid, I mean, it's uh, paid in an extremely expensively by doing genuine recursion and uh, having horrendous traffic onto the stack, right? Uh, so my preference is uh, always do from bottom up because then you don't have to think uh, twice how it's going to be executed. Uh, and the saving here usually is not that big, but you know in pipeline processors, uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of execution is just um, phenomenally fast. Um, so my preference is always do it bottom up rather than from top bottom, right? Because from top bottom, it would entail genuine recursion. If you do it from bottom up, 
It's only simple iteration, just a lookup uh, in the table and maybe some very basic operations, but that's a, a piece of cake. So uh, this is the answering your question. Uh, I prefer, I, it's your, you know, on the exam, you can do it any way you like, but um, um, Uh, but, um, of course, and uh, it will be for as long as the recursion is correct, you are all fine. But in practice, uh, I, well, that's at least in my experience, maybe. I, you can, in fact, try to implement it both ways uh, and compare the timing. Okay, so now. Except, you know, compilers are nowadays extremely clever and they recognize and actually switch it over and uh, uh, do it uh, from bottom up uh, without you knowing that this is what they do. Um, let us see now. Um, okay, use dynamic programming to count the number of non-decreasing sequences of integers uh, of length n so that the numbers are between 0 and m. So you are given two bounds. Uh, so you want to find the sequences which are non-decreasing uh, such that, what does this mean? It means uh, S1 is smaller or equal to S2, smaller or equal to S3, all the way, and they are of length, what was the length? Um, cha -cha -cha, of length N, so up to, uh, say, small n, so that n is smaller or equal than capital N. And each of uh, Si, uh, well, they are all positive, we can assume. And they are all integers, in fact. So Si is bigger or equal to 0, smaller or equal than m. How would you count the number of sequences uh, like that? Huh? No, no, how many of them that are b not longer than capital N many terms and uh, each of the element is smaller or equal than M. How would you solve this using DP? Uh, no, no, you don't have any, uh, you don't, you are not given numbers any. You are given only n and m, and you have to come up with uh, uh, hash n m, oops, uh, which is the number of sequences uh, right, such that they, are, they have at most n elements, and each element is smaller or equal than m. You have to, you want to find in total how many such. Uh, they have to be non-decreasing. No, no, they can be in any order, I mean in any um, otherwise, if they are successors of each other, it would be easy. So if n is, for example, uh, 3 and m is equal to 2, what would be uh, the sequences? 1, 1, 1, that would be 1. Then uh, uh, 1, 2, 2. And then you will have shorter ones, one, one, 
uh, you would have one tool and then you of land one say you would have just one and two so how would you count the total number so non-decreasing of land at most n and largest element is at most m sorry yeah 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 one one two well you would have uh, uh, as well, one, one, two, sure. So how would you solve? What is kind of, hmm? sorry? Longest, in you are not given any sub uh, sequence, right? Uh, you, you are just given these numbers, N and M. So for example, okay, let's list them all. Uh, so it would be, if you do only ones, uh, then you can do one, one, and two, right? Then you can, well, of course, you don't have to have three. You can also have only two, uh, one, one, and one, two. And of length one would be just one and two. So these are the only two of length uh, one. This would be the only two of length two. This would be for length three. And you would also have one, two, two, and finally two, two, two. So these would be, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So uh, sharp, sorry? Oh, I included zero. Oh, I don't like zero. <laughs> so if you don't have, just to make things a little bit. So uh, here, we have that if n is 3 and m is 2, we get altogether 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The answer is 8. Now, the question is, what is answer of 513 and uh, uh, 72? Of course, this is, uh, it will be a gigantic number, but how would you compute it recursively using dynamic programming uh, in a simple way. Sorry? Two-dimensional recursion, very good. So uh, how would you do it? How would you express, uh, very good, how would you express So it will be a two-dimensional recursion, right? Because we have two variables. Uh, so how would you compute uh, uh, the number of sequences so that uh, they are, which one was length? Uh, the first one is length, so that uh, each one of them is smaller than j. What are the cases here to consider? If, you, if they are all the numbers up to j, uh, what would be a way to go? Aha, so let's see, so uh, almost, uh, I wonder if one can actually do it that way. What is definitely uh, something that, uh, um, that kind of, what is the most important element here that tells you what comes in the future, what that limits the next? It's this will be equal to the sum. Uh, what is the over k equals from 1 to n, where k will be the first element of the sequence, right? So obviously, all the sequences, if they are 
they, if they start with a different element, they will be different sequences. Uh, so I can sum according to how big is the first element. Uh, uh, if the first element is uh, k, uh, right? If the first element is k, uh, how can I continue my sequence? Uh, what are all, uh, all elements now have to be bigger or equal than k? Uh, but they start with k, right? And this is not what we recursively have. We have only between 1 and the upper bound. How do I uh, reduce the number of continuations by how do I get rid of uh, this offset? Hmm? OK, if I start with a. Uh, say uh, if m is equal to 10 then and i start with number 7 right the, so the next can be maybe also 7 then it can be 8 9 uh, and, and eventually 10 uh, if i take this all these subsequences they are equinumerous with what subsequences Right? I know how to compute, say, n of uh, um, a length, say, i, uh, with bound on them up to, say, m. So these are all sequences that go from 0 to m. But here, I need sequences that go from 7 to some m. How do I reduce it to the problem when they start from 0? Exactly. So uh, the, uh, this will be a number of sequences such that uh, they are from, uh, um, they go up to, uh, up, to, up to i minus k, and of what length? So you see, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, my sequences can go between uh, 0 to, say, i. But the first element starts here. Well, this, then all sequences that start with here, the other elements can be k plus 1, k plus 2, or actually the next one can be also k, k plus 1, k plus 2 up to i, right? So these are all sequences between, ah, shoot, so I did need the 0. Uh, OK, so this one can be k. k is 1. Uh, blah, blah, blah. How do I? Yeah, I do need, uh, uh, do I need 0? Can I, you see what my problem is now? Because I can repeat also k, so it will be, OK, so k minus 1 then. k uh, minus 1 plus all the sequences that go between 1 and uh, 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 it will be i minus uh, uh, k uh, plus 1, right? Do you see what I'm doing here? Let us. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I should really, there is no reason to, this really makes it. I thought it was, uh, actually, I changed my mind. I love 0. <laughs> so uh, uh, the. They are all si are bigger or equal than 0, smaller or equal than, uh, than m. OK, now everything becomes simple because this will be n minus k uh, of length j minus 1. Right? Yes? The last element instead. Like just, 
Yeah, yes. And uh, is it, and then it is equal to yeah, n minus yeah, so, but the, you will get a sum, right? Because you, two sorry? It's only a sum of two things. Is it only of two? Oh, okay, 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 very good. So uh, you are saying, so I was actually violating my own principle here of minimal recursion. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's actually, uh, it's better than this. So do you understand this recursion? You see, for example, uh, if I start with number three and limit is seven, uh, the, what can I do? The next number can be 3 plus 0, 3 plus 0, and then eventually 3 plus 1, 3 plus 1, and then uh, uh, 3 plus 2, and so forth. So all that follows uh, is the same as if you just compute the offset. Uh, is a sequence 0, 0, 1, 1, and so forth, uh, up to n minus 3, right? So that's exactly what uh, this uh, tells you. But uh, uh, Seon says, uh, I am old and dumb. So uh, he says, right, uh, let uh, this be, uh, the stands for the following. Uh, Ij is, uh, uh, we will call it, uh, um, Okay, so we will we look at the very last element and we look at the uh, size of the last element. Is it equal to, will that work up to n? Is it equal to n or is it smaller than n? I think that's correct. So it will be just uh, the, um, and I'm not double counting anything, right? So it's uh, um, i minus, one, right, it's a, a number of sequences ah, equal to a number of sequences of length n minus, i minus one, and then, uh, um, but I have to say, I cannot, I have to index them by what is the very last one, right? Uh, okay, but if I say uh, that uh, uh, so uh, you are just looking whether the last is equal to n or it's not, right? Or j. Or j. So this will be um, i minus 1. Uh, so what is now the limit? The limit is... Uh, so that would be the case where the last sentence is there. Yeah. The limit. Right. Plus, ah, but you know what the problem is? It changes the definition now a little bit because this will be i minus 1, j minus 1, right? i j minus 1. i j minus 1, sorry. That, yeah. Now the problem with this... Ah, yes, so that's... That's good now because they're disjoint now. Yes, so what does this say? This is uh, uh, the number of sequences of length i minus 1 with the limit j because these sequences can be always completed uh, with the, the last element j plus all sequences that do not have last element equal to j, so that will be i j minus 1. Very good. Uh, so this is much cleaner. Uh. Okay. So as you can see, uh, there is, there are usually, I mean, often there are more than one ways uh, to, um, to solve the problem, but I should prefer this, right? This is essentially, it's kind of relaxation, right? Whether the last element is attained or not. Um, so this is preferred to this, right? Because, uh, of course, this is just a 
two-term recurrence. Well, this is essentially hidden another recurrence to sum them up. Okay. Um, very good. Let's do now some, uh, ah, let's do this problem that Sayon came up with a, a very, not maybe as efficient, but very nice solution, which was the following. So you are given a tree, right? And uh, um, was it binary or uh, just a tree? A rooted tree. Each edge of the tree um, has a cost associated with this uh, edge. Right? What you want to do is uh, you want to disconnect the root okay here is how we can formulate it right this is a network of spies that report to vladimir putin and these the leaves are all the trump members of the members of trump campaign right and there are some intermediate spies probably in the russian embassy maybe in the State Department too, we don't know that yet. Uh, and so uh, now the new head of FBI comes and he wants to disable Mr. Putin from talking to his uh, uh, spies. And he, you know the, what is the price of disabling each of these communication channels. So you want to cut off uh, paths so that there is no path from the root to any of its leaves. Uh, how would you solve this problem by DP? And uh, courtesy of Seyun, how would you solve it uh, by max flow? Hmm? How would you solve it by DP? And how would you solve it by max flow? When you have a tree, it kind of begs you to do recursion. What is the recursion when we have trees? The recursion is according to the subtrees, right? So uh, we want to find mean cost uh, of uh, disconnecting the root of the subtree to all of the leaves uh, of the subtree. Right? Now, if you have solved this for all of the subtrees that are uh, rooted at the children of, uh, of, uh, of uh, this node here, how would you compute the minimal cost of disconnecting this element from all the leaves uh, if you have already computed the cost for the subtrees? Uh, it is kind of similar to that. It goes by recursion of subtrees. How would you, so when you have this subtree, what are two only options in terms of disconnecting access of this root to the leaves? Uh, there are two things that you can do. What is the simplest kind of way of doing it? Uh, how would you disconnect this guy from all the sub? of the, all of the leaves of this tree. Exactly, so you just cut it off here, right? <laughs> and so what will be the recurrence? When will you cut this as opposed to doing it from this root uh, uh, down? Hmm? So opt. Uh, for this element T, uh, and here is uh, element uh, ch child 1, child 2, up to child K. So opt uh, for the tree rooted at T is mean of uh, um, the sum uh, 
it is the sum of what costs min over all children c i of uh, opt c i and uh, what else? Exactly. Uh, oh, and the uh, cost of uh, uh, t c i. Right? So this says uh, the total cost will be sum of uh, the costs to disconnect this guy from all individual leaves for each subtree. For each subtree, there are two ways. Either I cut here, or I recursively disconnect C2 as a root from all of the leaves. Which one do I choose? Whatever is cheaper, right? So I simply go sum over all uh, children of T, and then I take whatever is smallest, optimum solution for CI, or the cost of the edge TCI, Right, because if it's smaller, I'll just cut here. If not, I'll do whatever I did uh, to disconnect this guy from the leaves. Uh, how would you reduce it to max flow problem that uh, Seyon suggested? How would you reduce this problem to max flow problem? So you want to disconnect the root from all the leaves. So the root will be the source, but we have too many things. So what will you do first? Super thing, that's right. You connect them all with infinite capacity. And now what do I need? If I find max flow in this graph, then mean cut will be such a partition, right, that minimizes the cost of the vertices that uh, one end is on one side, the other end is on the other side of the cut, right? So it will be, uh, if you find max flow of this through, the, through this uh, structure, it will, and then mean cut, it will give you exactly the solution. But how would you find max flow in a network like this? If the network is three, unfortunately, to find max flow there, the easiest way is exactly the DP that we were doing, right? Because what is the max flow that you can have? It's max flow from this vertex. It's whatever is larger. Max flow from this vertex down to the leaves or the capacity of this link, right? Because the total flow from C2 to all of the leaves, uh, if it's larger than the capacity of uh, C2, of course, max flow will be limited by the capacity of this pipe. So these are actually two equivalent solutions because uh, this does reduce it to max flow, but the such max flow, essentially, easiest way of computing it would be uh, recursively from the leaves. Okay, so let's do the following. Uh, you, I will post on the web uh, on Friday uh, the solution to the turtle tower and another DP problem. Go through all these problems uh, and then we meet again on Friday. Please bring questions. Uh,